And I will try to do in the next 40, 45 minutes at the most, because I know the Institute covers a broad range of aspects. So I will be technical, but not too technical. And there might be many questions opened, and I'll be happy to discuss this after the seminar or through emailing later if you become interested in some aspect. But I just wanted to give you a taste of the work we have been doing, uh, how we placed a hypothesis uh, bridging the oxygen radical uh, formation in biology with the nitric oxide pathway, and how this has implications in human health and disease. So, Lawrence was talking about something that we like to say, which is, um, let's see, uh, okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, the good, the bad, and the ugly, with the good being nitric oxide, the bad, quote unquote, be the, the oxygen radicals, and the ugly being peroxynitride. This doesn't need to be like that all the time, but it's a good way to put it in perspective. Uh, redox biochemistry in, in human disease. So just to focus on one aspect of redox metabolism, um, I would like to start talking about mitochondria. And as we know, mitochondria is the major organelle for energy production through the oxidation of organic molecules that provide the electrons that then flow through the electron transport chain to generate electrochemical gradients that then end up with the formation of ATP. In that process, oxygen, molecular oxygen, is the, electron, the terminal electron acceptor and is reduced by four electrons to water and also in the process, uh, large amounts of CO2 are being formed. I will go back to the CO2 part of the story at the very end, as this is an emerging concept. So anyway, this um, central bioenergetic unit and their normal functioning consumes more than 90.8, 99.9% of oxygen all the way to water without the release of reactive oxygen intermediate. But there is a continuous flow of electrons leaking out of the electron transport chain at different sites, and I just showed two, continuously giving rise to the formation of what we collectively know as reactive oxygen species, such as superoxide radical anion, which is the one electron reduction product of oxygen, and hydrogen peroxide, which is the two electron reduction product of molecular oxygen, and also the dismutation product of superoxide radicals. So our mitochondria under normal healthy conditions are all the time generating small fluxes of superoxide and H2 through life. Of course, this can change and the numbers may raise a lot under pathologically relevant conditions. And in the process of aging, mitochondria are more prone to generate reactive oxygen species as the process of electron uh, transport and coupling becomes uh, less tight. Of course, to cope with this continuous formation of reactive oxygen species, mitochondria and uh, the cytosol and different organelles contain an array of antioxidant enzyme systems, including superoxide dismutases in the intermembrane space and in the matrix, and uh, hydrogen peroxide decomposer enzymes, including glutathione peroxidases, which are selenium, con con uh, selenium containing and most notably, the thiol containing peroxyredoxins that in the last decade have become a major actor in regulating human redox biology. And this was adapted from my mentor, uh, Bruce Freeman, that initiated uh, some of these theories in the 80s. And we see here at the cytochrome oxidase, what I was talking about, the tetra electron reduction of molecular oxygen all the way to water without the formation of reactive oxygen species. It's interesting that the cytochrome oxidase will not release the product of the oxygen reduction unless the four electron reduction is completed and then water comes off. So this is our like safety mechanism to minimize the leakage of electrons uh, to the formation of reactive oxygen species. But mitochondria make fail in working opti optimally, and then we go into the concept of mitochondrial dysfunction, 
And in many disease processes and in the aging process, mitochondrial function is compromised in what we call mitochondrial dysfunction. And some of the mitochondrial dysfunction is due to the excess formation of reactive oxygen species by mitochondria, leading to oxidative damage, and among other things, and leading to impair of uh, bioenergetic control, the release of pro-apoptotic factors such as the cytochrome C to promote apoptotic cell death of, or even uh, other possibilities that may lead to necrotic cell death. So mitochondria may also be an organelle that signals cell death, either apoptotic or necrotic. We have done extensive work on the interrelationship of mitochondrial signaling of cell death by the release of cytochrome C, but today I will not have the time to discuss about it, although I'll be happy to continue discussing if, if required. And then there is another actor that is coming to the field, that is nitric oxide. Nitric oxide was originally recognized as a physiological mediator. It's the endothelial derived relaxation factor that end up being part of the 1998 Nobel Prize of Physiology or Medicine. And nitric oxide was early on defined as playing roles in cytoprotections and cytoregulation, most notably at the very beginning, vasodilation, neurotransmission, inhibition of platelet aggregation, and also anti-inflammatory activities. However, in the early 90s, a few groups started to realize that under some conditions, nitric oxide could become cytotoxic. And many of the physiologists at that time were very reluctant to accept that nitric oxide could be harmful because they were coming from the vasodilation. And in trying to understand why and how NO could shift from being a signaling molecule to a pathogenic mediator, we realized that nitric oxide is a free radical, chemical characteristic that in a way was not perceived so well by the physiologist that were just looking to a molecule going from one compartment to another. NO is neutral, is hydrophobic, it can easily cross membranes, so it was an ideal signaling molecule to go from the endothelium to the smooth muscle to promote vasodilation. But realizing that NO has an impair electron and, and is synthesized for the most part enzymatically by the family of NOS, uh, leading to the oxidation of the guanidino group of arginine to citrulline and NO, we started to search for signals of NO shifting from physiology to pathology. And in the mid 90s, we were able to find with the development of an antibody against nitrotyrosine in human samples coming from university hospital patients, that some of the NO was going into the formation of nitrated species such as nitrotyrosine. This is very far from the physiology of NO interacting with the vanillate cyclase to the heme in a reversible way to do signaling. The nitrotyrosine formation is a stable post-translational modification that can alter protein structure and function. So to go from NO to nitrotyrosine, there has to be something in between that goes from signaling to oxidative chemistry. And that was found also a little later by investigators working in human uh, degenerative diseases, both in Parkinson's and in um, dementia in Lewy bodies, utilizing another antinitrotyrosine uh, polyclonal antibody one year after we published with the macrophages in the lymph nodes being immunostain, these are uh, deep nodes, and they did similar uh, experiment on the cortex of patients with neurogenerative diseases. They also found uh, that the Lewy bodies in the Parkinson's and in the dementia patients were also highly stained for nitrotyrosine. Again, suggesting a shift from NO going from cytoregulatory to pathogenic. So why is that? And this is where the biochemistry gets into the field again. The normal paradigm in the 80s and 90s was that much or most of the superoxide radical that was being generated in different organelles, including mitochondria, would be readily dismutated to hydrogen peroxide by the diffusion control reaction of the superoxide dismutases, which are 
uh, distributed across many different organelles in many different cell types and even the extracellular forms of superoxide dismutase. However, when and this actor comes into the field, you can see a dot here. This is the radical nature of superoxide and the radical nature of NO and per electron and per electron. And normally radical radical reactions are as fast as you can have for a reaction. This is what you call diffusion control reactions. So we, we propose that if NO and superoxide radicals, which are short lived, were found simultaneously in the same compartment, they would react as fast as it, as it can react and then generate this uh, coupling product, which is peroxynitrite anion. So this was the basic theory, the competition between enzymatic dismutation and non-enzymatic generation of peroxynitrite. This reaction has two consequences on the biology of NO. Consequence number one was and that was already seen by the physiologists in an indirect way. Consequence number one is that superoxide decreases the biological half-life of NO because it shuts down the signal of NO. But what's being formed is not inert. On the other hand, you are forming an extremely reactive nucleophile and peroxide that can initiate oxidation reactions per se. So you are shifting the biology and the chemistry from this subtle signal transduction, um, relatively mildly reactive free radical into a much more potent reactive species, while at the same time turning off the physiological actions of NO. So we call this the radical switch reaction. As you can see, and you don't have to have much appreciation for these values because these are just chemical kinetics. But I can tell you that a rate constant in the order of 10 to the 10th per molar per second is like the speed light for us. It's as fast as you can go. So the recombination reaction between superoxide and NO is even faster than the rate of recombination. The rate constant of recombination is even faster than the rate constant of the enzymatic dismutation that until this, it was believed to be the fastest a known reaction in biology for a compound to go from A to B. So now we have a reaction that over exceeds the dismutation reaction, which is the formation of peroxynitrite. Of course, this is a nice kinetic scheme, but now you need to go and demonstrate this in the real world in vivo. So it took like a good 15 years to 20 years from the early 90s to the early I would say mid 2000s, so that the hypothesis was fully tested uh, around the world by different groups in different models and even in human conditions and say, yes, this competition works in vivo. And, and then uh, you can then utilize some of this knowledge to intervene into the system if this is a toxic compound. So going back into history, and I know some of you have a, a large interest in the redox biology and vascular biology and NO effects. These are really important papers. One of these was by Salvador Moncada's group when they were working at the Wellcome Research Laboratories. Uh, this is a Nature 86. And they say superoxide anion, they, say, they don't say it's a radical. They say it's a superoxide radical first. But they say superoxide anion is involved in the breakdown of endothelium derived vascular relaxing factor whose chemical nature was unknown. But this was like an, a tip that superoxide fluxes were decreasing the half life of NO and diminishing vasodilation. And then in another paper, and this is a Nobel Prize winner, Louis Gnaro, they say pharmacological evidence that endothelium derived relaxing factor is nitric oxide. Use of pyrogalol, which generates superoxide, is a drug that does redox cycling to generate superoxide, and superoxide dismutase to study endothelium dependent and nitric oxide diseases that vascular smooth muscle relaxation. So, in a way, physiologically, there was an evidence of this reaction, but of course, the biochemical consequences in terms of the product and the actual reactions were unknown at this time. So, this is when we proposed this scheme. 
uh, working with Joe Beckman and Bruce Freeman and Ken Bush in 91, where we generated this structured hypothesis, which at the end provided opportunities to test every single of all of these steps to see if this hypothesis can hold right in vitro and in vivo. And even though this is a primitive scheme, if we see it with our eyes today, not in the 90s, in the 90s, uh, basically, now we would go and watch the posters, say, no, this is just chemistry. We don't care about this. This is just chemistry. The physiologists were really unhappy with the idea that nitric oxide could go through a cytotoxic pathway. But basically, what we were proposing is that this was the, 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 the common paradigm at that time. So we were looking to the right side part of the scheme saying, OK, but superoxide may come this way and then go through this chemistry. And we were testing thiol oxidation as an out outcome of the reaction. So this is the first stop flow record. And this is interesting for historical reasons, because then many groups worldwide utilize this fast kinetic technique as you can see, the, the, the time resolution here is uh, 400 milliseconds because the reactions of peroxynitrite with thiols and many other biotargets are fast. We see that under increasing concentrations of the amino acid cysteine, the, the, the absorbance of peroxynitrite that can be followed at 302 decreases, accelerates over time. And with this type of analysis, uh, you can come up with rate constant and they compare much higher than the rate constants with hydrogen peroxide. So for example, the reaction of peroxynitrite with cysteine is about 6,000 per molar per second, while the reaction of hydrogen peroxide, which at the time it was believed the strongest or the fastest thiol oxidant, is only five. It's a thousand times less reactive than peroxynitrite for cysteine. So anyway, with time, we started different groups started to characterize the reactions of oxidants with a per, a thiol containing compounds and peroxyredoxins in particular are extraordinary um, in uh, reducing peroxides very fast including peroxynitrite and hydrogen peroxide the reason i say this is that peroxyredoxins are in the signaling pathways and the catabolic pathways now in many different disease states. So I thought at least I can say something about peroxyredoxins. And basically what peroxyredoxins have is a very fast reacting thiol in the active site. So I said hydrogen peroxide reacts at five, peroxynitrite reacts at 5,000. With peroxyredoxins, usually they react at 5 million so these are really fast reacting thiols. So if a, if, a, if a peroxide is being generated of the many possible thiols it can attack, and glutathione is in high concentrations, they preferentially will go to the peroxyredoxins um, to form from the thiol a sulfenic acid derivative, and then there is a redox chemistry that goes after that. So we put these ideas together for those that may be interested in the chemistry of these processes um, in chemical reviews, catalysis of peroxynitrate peroxide reduction by fast reacting protein thiols, which are a small subset of cellular thiols that give specificity to these reactions. Because one of the questions we have always had in free radical and redox biology is, how can any of these be specific? You are forming oxidants, they can react with many things, so what? So, Different groups have found that this is not the case, that there are some highly reactive uh, targets that channel and funnel uh, the main reactions and then bring specificity to the system, and peroxyredoxins are one of them, including their participation in redox-dependent circadian rhythms, when H22 is generated over time then peroxyredoxin sense this, and this is translated through redox sensitive transcription factors. I will not have too much time to talk about this, but I want to say that there is kinetic and there is specificity, and some of that specificity depends on some preferential uh, reactants with oxygen. So just to show you a nice structural biology cartoon, this is the active site of a peroxyredoxin. This is the active site 
thiol, what we call the peroxidatic thiol. This is HOOH, hydrogen peroxide, peroxynitrite, or a lipid hydroperoxide. Any of those can react with the thiol, leading to the formation of the sulfenic acid derivative, and then the reduction of uh, hydrogen peroxide to water, peroxynitrite to nitrite, or the lipid hydroperoxide to the lipid alcohol. This is, these are the type of reactions uh, that can occur with these enzymes. And to see the whole catalytic cycle, so this is O N N sorry O N O O H. This is peroxynitrous acid, which is the uh, conjugated acid of peroxynitrate anion, reacting with the peroxidatic thiol to form a compound, a, a, a transitory compound, an intermediate state that leads to the formation of sulfenic acid and nitrite. And this is the way to catabolize peroxynitrite in vivo, but then you leave the enzyme oxidized and this can then promote some uh, other type of secondary redox reactions. So, if, if, if the above was the 1991 scheme, then we end up having the 2013 scheme, and this arrow connects about two decades of research where we understand more about how peroxynitrite anion peroxynitrous acid that come from these reactions participate promoting oxidative chemistry in vitro and in vivo and one of the actors i would like to point out now because we all work with cells or with tissue is the critical role of co2 carbon dioxide modulating redox reaction this is a relatively uh, little uh, analyze aspect in redox biology. I will go to this at the very end. But CO2 levels, either because you expose cells to CO2 of the pH is changing and the bicarbonate levels is changing, or because metabolically you are activating the pentose phosphate pathway, all of these fluxes of CO2 will influence the redox chemistry because there is there are reactions of the peroxides with the CO2, leading to secondary species. So, I talk about the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion is a central site of peroxynitrite formation. Why is that? Because the mitochondrion, we already said, that is a continuous source of superoxide. So there you have superoxide being formed all the time. We are generating superoxide all the time in mitochondria. So if, the, if there is enough formation of NO in the cytosol, NO, among other things, will diffuse into the mitochondria and we'll find a perfect compartment, O2 minus, superoxide and NO together in mitochondria generate peroxynitrite, and you can follow this by the modification of key components uh, where you can find nitration of enzymes, such as the nitration of the manganese SOD. Another organelle, and I will say just a word at the very end of the talk, where you, you load lots of peroxynitrite by but for the uh, idea of pathogen killing, here are the phagosomes. The phagosomes are a central organelle for the formation of reactive species, including peroxynitrate. So, oxidation and nitration of intraphagosomal bacteria or intraphagosomal parasites is a central aspect of the cell mediated immunity. I have to also say, that of course the pathogens defend themselves for the action of the oxidants so some of the pathogens that are equipped with high levels of systems that consume these oxidants are, are more virulent so there is an interplay between oxidant ox, oxidant release oxidative killing in the phagosome and oxidative evasion through mechanisms that bacteria and, path and parasites may uh, evolve to do immune escape. So, one of the post-translational modifications that serve, served ourselves, I showed some immunochemistry in the past, to follow the formation of uh, reactive species derived from NO, is the formation of nitrotyrosine. You saw the lymph node that was nitrated, utilizing the antibody against nitrotyrosine, and also you saw some aggregates in the human brain which were nitrated, and you can also do this in an artery wall, 
uh, in a hypertensive patient, an atherosclerotic patient, and you will see nitrated buildings. And that nitration occurs by radical reactions that lead to the formation of this compound, nitrotyrosine. So now in nitrotyrosine, you can follow immunochemically and also, of course, by mass spec based techniques. You can identify and you can detect, and you can map the nitrated proteins and specifically which nitrated amino acid within a protein to see if that modification has anything to do with the change of function or not. So there is a lot we still don't know about nitration, but among the things that nitra nitration promote is aggregation, because the protein tend to become more hydrophobic. And then there might be some functional consequences, loss of, or gain of toxic function. And of course, nitrated proteins can promote illicit autoimmune responses. This has been already observed in different cardiovascular pathologies, that excess generation of nitrated proteins in the vessel wall by increased superoxide and nitric oxide interactions elicit autoimmune responses with the generation of autoantibodies against nitrotyrosine. And what about nitrotyrosine? The nitration of nitro or the nitration of tyrosine results in the addition as of a bulky substituent to the phenolic ring. But in addition, this is a very important aspect. The pKa of the hydroxyl group of the phenolic ring of tyrosine is dropped by three pH units, making, making that this hydroxyl is partially deprotonated. So for many proteins, nitration means also a gain of negative charge because of the drop in the pKa. And this is most important for many proteins that upon nitration undergo conformational changes and or modify their function. Also, if you nitrate this Phenolic hydroxyl is incapable to phosphorylate. So nitration also dis can disrupt tyrosine kinase dependent phosphorylation cascades because the nitrotyrosine cannot phosphorylate. So there are interesting aspects. Some of these still in progress because it's not easy to, to correlate nitration and changes in signaling in vivo, but in vitro, you can really show that nitrated peptides don't phosphorylate. And as I said, there, there has been a focus on mitochondria. Um, one of the proteins we can follow is the nitration of the manganese SOD or nitration of the cytochrome C. And I have also to say that there are some things that also occur in the nuclei, uh, especially under necrotic type excess of reactive species. So this is the cover art from one of our PhD students that finished 10 years ago, Valeria Valles, and then made it to the cover of archives. And these are, this is a mitochondrion, NO, which is sort of a, this whitish cloud diffusing into mitochondria. And the yellow is the formation of peroxynitrite, which is in fact yellow when you have it in the lab because it absorbs in the 302, 310 nanometer region. So if you have a healthy tissue, a healthy vessel, a healthy brain, a healthy heart, and you investigate the basal level of nitrated proteins, and it took us a long time to convince ourselves that normal tissue already has nitrated proteins, so we are already oxidized and nitrated, no matter what we do, this is part of life. But the healthy tissues are already nitrated. This increases with the aging process in the artery wall, of healthy aged animals, for example, of healthy aged humans, you see more and more and more nitrated proteins over time. But within the tissue, mitochondrial proteins are nitrated in about one order of magnitude higher than the nitration of the other organelles. This is under healthy conditions. So mitochondria are a central site for the formation of nitrated species. And what we can measure is a footprint, which is the formation of nitrotyrosine. So I, again, I show this because I know many people uh, from other places are, are looking. And this is a good source of information. It took us four years to write this. 
Silvina Bartesagi that is attending the meeting, um, um, and Gerardo Ferrer-Sueta, Nicolás Campolo, Madi, Trujillo, and all the group made major efforts to um, put this together that contains over 800 references. So it's a good source of information. And then here, um, um, we put together this idea of the manganese superoxide dismutase uh, is nitrated and inactivated in vivo, and that generates a vicious cycle because you need manganese SOD to eliminate superoxide. So this is the active site of manganese SOD. I will not show any primary data of this. I just wanted to show you some nice pictures of the active site of this essential enzyme, which is a manganese SOD. is the key antioxidant enzyme in mitochondria that removes superoxide. This is the manganese site. And this is, and normally superoxide comes in and H2 goes out. But peroxynitrite can also penetrate into the active site, O, O, N, O. O, O, N, O, yes. And you see this is a vicinal tyrosine, which is only five Armstrongs away from the manganese, and this is central for catalysis. It participates in a hydrogen bond network. Anyway, if peroxynitrate penetrates the active site and reacts with the manganese, it promotes the nitration of the vicinal tyrosine 34, and that kills the enzyme. And this initiates a mitochondrial vicious cycle, because now the enzyme is incapable to decompose in superoxide. And, and this is what happens. Um, you have the tyrosine 34, which now is nitrated, NOO. You have a nitro group. And we said the pKa dropped by 3 pH units, so this is negatively charged. So the anion can't penetrate because hysteric hindrance plus electrostatic repulsion. So, yes, this compound peroxynitrate can participate in a series of um, conditions. And, you know, we wrote this almost 15 years ago, so now there is much, much more information gathered. And we did some work with motor neuron degeneration together with uh, Luis Barbeito and Alvaro Esteves. And uh, we know that peroxynitro is proptotic in vitro and in vivo, and you can intervene in the system in vitro and in vivo at different steps to rescue dying motor neurons or neurons in general. And we became interested in the last few years in mitochondrial directed redox medicine. Uh, because we know mitochondrial dysfunction is key. And so we apply, and uh, we're very proud of this, because we took this antibody from Ron Mason's lab, which is an antibody against protein DMPO. Uh, DMPO is an steam trap. This is usually utilized for chemistry of radicals, because a radical reacts with DMPO and generates an spin adduct that you can follow by EPR. But in this case, we utilize this to inject animals with EMPO. And our reasoning was that if protein radicals are being generated in vivo, protein radicals may react with EMPO and form an adduct. The adduct in vivo will not be stable, will oxidize to a nitron. The nitron is very stable. So maybe utilizing an anti-DMPO nitron antibody, we can see the in vivo formation of protein radicals. So we apply this antibody to animals uh, that were developing ALS-like uh, symptomatology. This is a mice model, the G93A SOD1 mice, that develops this ALS-like disease with motor neuron degeneration in the uh, anterior horn. And here, utilizing the immunospin trapping for the first time in vivo, we were able to find that in the um, here, in the degenerating motor neuron, uh, there was immunostaining against DMPO protein adducts, which we can also see in the brain and in the spinal cord uh, during um, Western blotting. Much of this inhibited by the co-administration with a peroxynitrite decomposition catalyst of metal origin, which are the manganese, the porphyrins. These are kind of a proof of concept. These compounds decompose peroxynitrate fast. You can give them in vivo 
Of course, it's not the only thing they do in terms of redox chemistry, this uh, redox mimics, but you can give animals this manganese porphyrins, and the manganese porphyrins um, utilize electrons from the electron transport chain to become reduced, and in the reduced state, because they are in the manganese 3 plus when you give to the animals. But the manganese 3 plus is not good to decompose peroxine nitrate. You need the compound to go to the manganese 2. So the manganese 2, we found in vivo, takes electrons from the electron transport chain. Now you have the manganese 2, and then the manganese 2 decomposes peroxine nitrate to the nitrite. And then you are eliminating, and then you reinitiate a catalytic cycle. So a few micromolar of the manganese porphyrins in mitochondria have a great effect in terms of protection in vitro and in vivo, not only in neurodegeneration, but also in inflammation. And some time ago, this idea that we had from inferential data working with pure mitochondria, we utilize, we utilize Raman resonance spectroscopy uh, together with a collaboration with Professor Murgida from the University of Buenos Aires. And without going into any details, I can tell you that these, the manganese porphyrins cross the cells membrane, and then they become reduced. And we were able to see the reduction of the manganese porphyrins in endothelial cells uh, by these redox uh, processes. So these compounds can really behave as catalytic uh, decomposers of peroxynitrate and other species in vivo. So to start working with these concepts in animals, uh, you need to treat them in the case of chronic diseases for a long time. Uh, the experiments I was showing with the manganese porphyrins was just like a week or 10 days treatment, but we started uh, a treatment, uh, two types of treatment, one with um, um, mitochondrial targeted uh, UV quinone and the other one with dichloroacetate, which is a Krebs cycle activator. Uh, so we were working with a redox by inertia axis. So this is the MitoQ that was originally proposed by a good colleague and collaborator in Oxford, Mike Murphy. The MitoQ is a mitochondrial targeted variation of ubiquinone that accumulates almost 500 fold in mitochondria and exerts a strong cytoprotective actions and redox regulatory actions in vitro and in vivo. And these are uh, just ALS animals. We started to treat these animals when the symptoms started. So the treatment of these animals with oral mitoQ, so we formulated with Mike Murphy an oral formulation of mitoQ, just to became a sort of a medicine. So we started to provide the mitoQ to the animals when the animals started to develop the motor neuron symptoms. It was not preventive, it was treatment. And of course, the ALS animals die, and the ALS animals plus mitoQ also die, but we found a significant increase in mobility and, and life uh, with mitoQ to an extent that was about the best you can do with other things. So as a proof of concept for a single uh, dosage was, was fine. And you can see motor function here. The animals are starting to lose the motor function, what we call the grip strength test. And with the mitoQ, they maintain strength for a long time. So this provided a sort of concept that mitochondrial targeted redox therapies would, could serve this animal to restore mitochondrial function. And if, on the other hand, we intervene the Krebs cycle with dichloroacetate, another treatment, just to improve the bioenergetics, and the way that the chloroacetate works is by the inhibition of the pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase. So the pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase is the off enzyme for the pyruvate dehydrogenase. So this goes opposite to what we normally know is phosphorylation increases activity. In the case of the PDH, phosphorylation turns it off. So DCA, like chloroacetate, blocks PDH kinase. So you have more PDH active, so more pyruvate goes to acetyl-CoA and then more Krebs cycle. And you can measure that. When you do that, the animals look better. Just to show you some data, uh, which are more recent, um, 
oral disease administration to symptomatic animal decreases motoneuron loss, angliosis, and improves mitochondrial energy metabolism. So we think that these are good hints to say that restoring mitochondrial homeostasis, restoring mitochondrial bioenergetics, and improving mitochondrial turnover, which I will not show here, aged, aged mitochondria, that now we know we can remove and replace by new mitochondria, is offering novel opportunities for degenerating diseases. I will not show the replacement of mitochondria because of time. So I think I have a few more minutes just to show you, this is a pandemic paper, okay? We did it in the pandemia. When we got back the uh, comments from the reviewers, it required many new experiments in the animal house. So it was a real nightmare because everything was complicated, as you know. So we are proud of having been able to finish this with the Munich group led by Professor Heike Beck. And basically, again, going again to mitochondria, we see that you need the right mitochondrial redox homeostasis. And this is an in vivo model of mice with endothelial election of the thyroredoxin reductase gene. So this is only affecting mitochondria from vascular endothelium. And in these animals, of course, you need this to put the electrons on the peroxyredoxins, which are these thiolene enzymes that are critical to detoxify peroxides. So all of this is redox. So these animals don't have this, so they have compromised all this redox pathway. And to make a long story short, you see all the tissues of these animals, in this case, utilizing an anti-nitrotyrosine antibody, you see that the knockouts of endothelial thyroredoxin reductase, which is mitochondrial, become in the glomeruli. These are, these are the kidneys, highly stained for nitrotyrosine, the glomeruli it doesn't look good. The aorta, carotid arteries, other arteries, everything looks pretty altered, ultrastructurally, unfunctioning, vasodilation is compromised. And looking to the formation of peroxynitrite ex vivo, and I will take a minute not just to take water, but to tell you that we are utilizing chemical probes, fluorescein boronate in this case to visualize peroxynitrate formation. So in parallel, Natalia Rios from the lab is developing redox probes to visualize redox intermediates in tissues. So here we were taking arteries, taken from the animals. So ex vivo, we were exposing the animals to the probes. And when you see the light on is in the knockout, more peroxynitrate as a measure of fluorescent boronate oxidation, and if you put the nitric oxide synthase inhibitor, the signal goes down, and if you put an NO donor from the outside, the signal goes back up. So peroxynitride is being generated in these vessels, and we know is part of the mitochondrial dysfunction. So now we characterize and tested mitochondrial targeted boronates. So these are chemical probes, that as we did with the MitoQ as a drug, we can do this with a probe. So we do mitochondrial targeting of the probes. So this mitochondrial targeted boronate, which once it reacts with peroxynitra, gives you a fluorescence. And this is what you see here, again, ex vivo in vessels. You can see that in the knockout, there is mitochondrial formation of peroxynitrite. And this is correlating to vascular dysfunction and alteration of integrity. Um, so, the reason this is going on is in part because as in these animals, these systems are compromised, the knockouts in the thyroredoxin reductase, then the peroxyredoxins do not have the electrons needed to decompose peroxynitrite, and then you see more peroxynitrite, there is more oxidation, more nitration, and vascular dysfunction. So, to round up, this, uh, I wrote this a few years ago, so some of the basic ideas you can follow in this paper. And this is sort of like the central concept. As much as you have electron flowing and you have oxygen, you will always have superoxide being generated in our tissues, healthy or unhealthy. And I didn't have time to talk, but for the people that is interested in infectious diseases, 
This is a recent review from our group on reactive species and pathogen and CO2 networks during phagocytosis and this, this paper that we recently published. And then again, to show you some new information before I finish, I won't go into any detail, but this is at the moment in press, is how to connect carbon dioxide formation in vivo or exposure or hypercapnia with peroxide metabolism, something we need to take care of when we do our model systems to control for CO2. So this is uh, again in press, not the final version available, but and then this is sort of a, the, the paper we have now with an updated view of the you know the good, the bad, and the ugly as to 2022 that we just got out in physiological reviews for those that may be interested in the physiological sides of this. So thank you for your kind attention to the ones attending personally and the ones attending by Zoom. And I'll be happy to answer questions. And I'm sure Professor Banks and all the ICGB community will appreciate that also through the, through the years, different investigators from the group uh, have enjoyed in one way or the other, including international courses, support of ICGB. So thank you very much.